Okay, well, we're about to get started. So thank you again for everybody who's put in that. that the chat seems very lively. I'm going to keep admitting uh, a few people as they join late. Um, but that reminder, keep an eye on the chat. We are inviting questions and comments in there. We've got a couple of uh, scheduled sessions during this morning's uh, session um, to cover those questions. And we will be asking you for your opinions as well. Uh, this isn't just a one way street. OK, so let's go. And hopefully you're in the right place if you want to talk about the challenge of authentic leadership. Um, I'm going to start by introducing my colleagues, the other faces you can see on the screen. Um, so Avila, please uh, go ahead and introduce yourself to the, the folks today. Thanks, Kieran. Yeah, nice to meet everyone. I'm the client relations manager for the senior leader apprenticeship program that we'll be discussing a little bit later, as Kieran mentioned. Thanks, Avila. Paul, a man who needs no introduction, but please, if you can introduce yourself, that'd be great. That's tautological, isn't it? If I don't need any introduction. Sorry, B. Um, yeah, so my name's uh, Paul Evans. Um, uh, yeah, I've got a doctorate. So is everybody else around here. It's not important. Um, I'm the programme director for the um, senior leadership apprenticeship. So that, so I teach on the on the unit, and I ostensibly I manage the um, the programme as well with my colleagues in admissions, but also my colleague um, Anya, um, who is the director of apprenticeship programmes for for the university or for the business school. So you'll see quite a bit of me should you sign up. I hope you do. But you'll also, as in terms of my role as being the director of the programme, but you'll also you'll see me as being a tutor. Uh, I used to tutor a unit called uh, uh, Authentic Leadership and Culture, um, but I'm handing that on to a colleague um, and it will be even better now. I'm sure of it. But I will be tutoring a, a unit which I'm calling digital transformations, but it's about innovation in the digital world. So I'm an academic and I'm a manager um, and you'll see a fair amount of me. Thank you, Paul. Um, so hi, folks, I'm Kieran. I work with Paul and Avila. I'm on uh, responsible for client relations. So we talk to a lot of people who are interested in coming on programmes and a lot of employers who want to send their people on programmes. So if you've got any questions about today's content, or the programmes, uh, drop a note to myself or Avila. Our contact details will appear at the end. OK, so uh, the session today, what we're going to cover? little very tiny introduction from me and then straight into Paul's section where he's going to talk about uh, the challenges of or the challenge of authentic leadership. Uh, we'll have time for a Q&A with Paul um, and then we'll also just sort of um, tie up this all in the in the, the sense of where it fits in the program uh, that we, we offer uh, where of which apprenticeship leadership is a uh, authentic leadership is a part and my colleague Avila will be covering that. So a very brief introduction. Um, where does this sit? Where does this come from? So the topic today, as Paul's mentioned, comes from our senior leader apprenticeship. And just take a minute, the six core units that you can see appearing on the screen. And we're just looking at a very small piece of one of the first units, authentic leadership and culture, as Paul mentioned. Um, and if you wanted to look a bit deeper into that, um, within that unit, these are the sorts of um, topic subjects that we might be looking at. Again, take a minute just to look at that. So this is we're, we're dipping a, a toe in the water of authentic leadership over the next sort of 45 minutes. We, 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 we can't give you the same experience as coming on a program here, but we hope we'll give you a sense of some of the topics that you might cover or, or in particular some of the issues around authentic leadership. So that's setting it into context. It's part of a, an ongoing program that we provide here. Um, but before we start, just take a minute, have a think. Um, I said we'd be asking you questions. So if you would like to pop into the chat, what does authentic leadership, authentic leadership, what does it look like? What does it mean to you? Just a couple of comments. It doesn't have to be chapter and verse, just a couple of comments. What does authentic leadership look like or, or mean to you? OK, we've got br bringing your true self to the team, being yourself whilst leading. Ownership like that. Open and honest. Any other thoughts from any folks? Um, it's not it's not a it's not a quiz. There's no right answers here. Um, OK, leading rather than managing integrity, leading for the good of the team, uh, no self-interest. OK, very interesting there. OK, uh, it's a big difference between being a leader and a manager. That, that crops up a lot around here, Bradley. It does. And looking to help people become better. 
uh, leading from within. Um, Paul, any comments on, on on the comments that are coming in there on, on on leadership? Does that sort of segue nicely into your your section, or any any comments? Oh, I don't you know, really. Uh, possibly, we'll we'll see when we get there. I mean, there there are lots of um, I think really interesting points that have been raised um, that's here, and I think we could take. Um, we could take a number of them in terms of, let's say, um, being genuine. Um, not just to pick on you, uh, Emma Jane, but um, being genuine it, as, a, as a point, as an interesting point. And it's, it's worth me pointing out before I just deal with sort of like being genuine, is that we don't, on the programme, we don't give you definitive answers. It's not a prescriptive programme. It's not for me to say to you, look, I'm the expert. This is what authentic leadership is. Do this. One, two, three, four. And if you do that, then you'll be an authentic leader. Because I don't understand your contexts and I can never understand your context as well as as well as you understand your own contexts. So on that basis, I can't give you a prescriptive answer as to how to be authentic, depending upon the dynamic environment that you're working in, the sector, the people that you're working with, because all of these things have an impact upon um, how you would respond in kind back to people that you're working with and, and the organisation, the organisational requirements and and so on and so forth. And within within all of these things is that there are genuine tensions that exist. So as an example, I would suggest to you that, that you could be more genuine today than you are tomorrow. It's not a fixed construct, is it? Is it how genuine are you? And 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 how might you show your the fact that you're being genuine? And these are things I'll touch upon in the little presentation that I'll I'll do later on. But whilst we might say, well, I, I try to be genuine, well, what exactly does that mean? And how genuine can you be if, for example, being genuine is not fixed within the individual. What, what is, is, is there a tension that exists between what you define as being genuine and what your organisation requires from you in order to be genuine as well, and what all of your co-workers require from you to be genuine? So there's that you're being pulled in three different ways. So that means that it's problematic. So what we have to do with, and this is the thing that I'll always tell all my students within leadership, is that if leadership was dead simple, we'd all do it and there won't be a problem. You know, we, we as human beings are uniquely predisposed to be able to deal with interpretation and subjective and, and, and all of these different things. And so as a consequence is that you're you, we, we, we're inviting you and we'll show you, provide you with a pathway in order to be able to resolve some of these conundrums to your own satisfaction, rather than me telling you what it is that you're supposed to, to do in order to be authentic. And that would deal with a number of the points I think that we've, we've touched upon there. OK, Paul. Uh I think we've we've just lost you for a second. You've just gone on to mute, um, but it's a it's a good good reminder to everybody if you're not um, if you're not presenting today, <laughs> you're back in the room. If you could, uh, everyone else, if you can keep your your microphone on mute, that would be wonderful. Yeah. There's a bit of background noise creeping in there, Paul. Yeah. As, so, as to what... Yeah. So I I think I dealt with the notion about gen uh, being genuine, and that that would be with all the sorts of values that you hold. You might say that you're honest. Well, how honest are you really? Has anybody ever been involved in the reorganisation of a team in order to lose somebody? Well, we're structuring, but we're actually one of the motives is, well, we might lose so-and-so. Well, that's not very honest, is it? But nevertheless, we can hide behind the logic of the restructuring in order to be profoundly dishonest. So how honest are we and how honest is it even possible to be on a day-to-day -day basis? So these things are dynamic, they shift, they change. But we can work with the shifts and the changes. And as I said, I don't know if you, you heard me, is that rather than saying, well, let's try and simplify things, let's deal with the complexities of it. And let's resolve some of the complexities to your own satisfaction so that you can function as a leader, but also that you can you, you can learn and you can develop in order to improve your practice. And that's the point of it, the practice of being a leader is that you design strategies in order for you to be able to improve, to become better. And that is not just something which is a, a one quick fix. It just doesn't happen on a programme. So we give you a PG dip and you say, well, now I'm a leader. 
is you are a leader now. It's just that you can be better at it. And I don't know. I've never met anybody that can't lead. And I've met anybody that can't be better, irrespective of where they sit in the hierarchy. Now, I can bang on about this for days. So I think I'll stop now and I'll just hand back to Kira and bring some sense back to this presentation. No, thank you. Thank you, Paul. I think um, hopefully what you've got there, folks, is, is that sense of the space that we're offering. You know, a lot of the time leaders are busy with the, busy, uh, the business of leading and managing and all of the differences combined therein um, and complexities. I think coming on a course like this or attending a webinar like this gives you a bit of a, a, a breathing space, a space to step out and reflect and look back and and i know um, one of the things we we pride ourselves here at this on this particular course is being challenging so um with that in mind um i'd like uh, paul are you happy to start running um, some of your slides now i'll hand over the reins to you um as i said if anyone's got any questions um pop them in the chat paul i've uh, we've got a session at the end for you to answer questions um, unless you want to ha have questions as you go what would be your preference um, my preference would, I think, to just um, do what I'm doing um, and uh, to come back to, uh, I think that if you look at the um, the, the questions for me, uh, I'll be keeping an come eye through, you keep an eye on them because there, there might be lots that, that come through. And so if what you can do is at the end of it is that you can say to me, um, you've got some questions and then I'll I'll answer those questions. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. So we'll do that then. At the moment, I'm struggling to be able to get this on to be able to my there. Does that actually come forward now? Can you see that? We've we've got a uh, we're looking at your mentee uh, QR code at the moment. Yeah. Paul. OK, so I've lost everything else that's on it. This is. Uh, hmm. OK, All right. Well, I'll assume that you can see this. So what, what I do want you to do is that I want you to use your smartphones. Oh, somebody's already somebody's joined. That's three of you. That's good. So use the QR code and join it, please. And then if you tap the little heart that will be on the your smartphone screen, which says instructions, it will it will indicate to me that you've joined. So, <clears throat> Kieran, you can do this as well. And Avila, we can all do it. Um, so we've now got 10. How many are in the room, Kieran? We should have about 20, 25, 26 people. So we're about halfway through. So let's come on. Let's everybody get in there. So I'm going to ask you a question uh, in a minute about authentic leadership and identity. And, and what I started to point out was while you're doing this, let me just talk about the about the the, 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 the our approach to the these things. As I say, it's not for us to be prescriptive, but what we do base our work upon is by you build upon the foundations of your own experiences and through working with other people in order to actually work out what's true to you. Now, we would say that if it works, then it's true to you and that's good enough. OK, so what we're leading you down is a pathway towards you defining what works for you and how you can incorporate all of those things into your own practice in order for you to become a better leader. Now, whether or not you're authentic or not, as a consequence of that, there are some more challenges that I think that exist there. And, and that's what I'm going to try and pick upon today in terms of looking at those different challenges that might exist in terms of us being more authentic. OK, so that's better. Right, we've actually got some sense that's going on. <clears throat> Right, so I'm going to move the slide on now on your, your, your smartphone is that what it will say it will, it will either bring up the next slide um, perfectly or it might get a little dialogue box at the top that says the presenter has changed the slide. You want to go to the new slide, then tap on yes and then go to the next new slide and that will look like. This, what are your identities? OK. <clears throat> So within those identities, I've given you an I've given you an uh, an example of of what they might look like. So the, the question asks you, so what, what you know, how do you what do you identify with or how do you identify yourself? And you can go as far ranging as you possibly want to do. And I've just put four in just to say that this is how I want you to present it. 
is, is like as as I've put down husband because I'm married. You know, it's a strong part of my identity is is being a husband. I'm an academic teacher as well, if you like, but that's a strong part of my identity. I'm also a dad. I've got two children, and my children do. I identify with the with the fatherhood aspects of what I do, and I'm also a manager. I work as an academic and a manager, but I have, as you see, at least four identities that are there. What are yours? Well, there we go. Mother, hard worker, challenging, and a leader. Blimey, there's one here. There's, there's millions of them. Look, mom, wife, friend, project manager, driver, commercial person, doer. Oh, I like that one, a doer. We could do with more of them. Sailor. There's all sorts of questions we could ask about that one. Mum, wife, offshore, professional, regulator, leader, dad, captain. We've got some people who are or claim that they're leaders already, which is fine. This is fine. I'm not suggesting that you're not. Um, we've got one that's a leaner. I think that might well be leader. Forward thinking. Liverpool FC. Thank you for bringing that one up, my friend. Is that somebody's actually gone into their own personal lives, but actually your personal life actually is quite an important part and, and actually associating yourself with something like Liverpool Football Club is a really important part of your life and I absolutely get that and if I was to be brutally honest about my own identities I might put husband academic dad manager I might also have put beer enthusiast but then I don't want to do that why would I might not do that because I don't want the way that you perceive me to be altered by the fact that what I've put up there is if I said beer enthusiast, maybe a bit nerdy or so on, but what if I'd have put boozer? Yeah, then you might think of me in a different way than what I'd put up there in terms of other, uh, other identities. There's a lot of the identities that we've got on here, and I'll just reflect down them as we go down them a, a, bit, a bit further down there from below the Liverpool FC. A lot of these are very much related to our professional sort of um, perspectives. Um, we're stretching into some other things. We've got one here that's a fitness fanatic. Fitness fanatic. Well, imagine, if you will, just for a minute, is that if we are... If we describe ourselves as being a fitness fanatic, what does that conjure up in your own minds? Yeah, what what does that what does that mean? What does that look like? I'm not asking you to respond to that. Don't do that. I, 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 we don't. I don't necessarily need you to do that. But you know, what might that actually conjure up in, in terms of the way that you perceive somebody? So somebody says, well, you know, so and so is joining the firm tomorrow. He's a fitness fanatic. How might we? respond to that how might we perceive people so the point that i'm making here is twofold is that one is that you've got all sorts of different identities each individual comprises a number of different identities some of which you're happy to disclose others you might wish to keep more personal there's nothing on here about religion as an as as as, uh, as an observation and they could be. <clears throat> um, so we were might dis we might disclose some, but we might want to keep some hidden. Now, why might that be? Because we're all well aware that how what we disclose of ourselves actually invokes different reactions from other people, from the recipients of it. So when we're at work, we tend to be rather guarded, I think, or can be quite guarded about the way in which we would share our identities because we want to be perceived in a particular positive way. Now, leader. Well, if we want to be perceived as a leader, and I'm really pleased that some of you put that leader up there as a leader, as a particular identity. Well, what exactly would that look like? What might we need to do in order to be demonstrate ourselves that we are and for people to accept us as being a leader? So that's one thing is that there are we, we, we each individual possess a number of different identities, some of which we're happy to disclose. Others we would rather keep private. Or depending upon the context, we might disclose different identities at different times. The work based identity is quite strong and actually it's determined for who by by ourselves or by what everybody else expects us to be as a leader. And then the other thing that's that, that's in there as well is that if you have many different identities, 
Which one of them is authentic? I'll just let that sink in for a minute. Authentic leadership suggests that you should really identify with your one true self. Well, which one out of all of those? I'll go back to the screen. For me, husband, academic, dad or manager is my one true self. Which one would I present at work as my one true self? Now, what, what if it was dad? That was I felt was my one true self and I actually presented myself as being a father like figure. Tell people what to do. I depend upon what your what, what your father's like, you know, sort of thing. So let's let's try and say my dad, because I might measure myself as my father against my experiences of my dad, and then I project that at work. Well, that's not a good place to be in for any of us. I can tell you that now. Academic, maybe I could get away with that, but actually, if I was to say, well, what does the theory suggest on everything that ever faced me? Is that pretty soon people get very irritated with me, wouldn't they? You might well be getting irritated with me already. I don't know. But we'll, we'll, we'll address that when we come through it. But the point is, is that what is your which identity do you present at work and why? And if you really want to test yourself and I'll invite you to do this, not now, but later on, film yourself. Film yourself responding to two questions. So set up your camera and film yourself. One, I'm saying, what is the biggest issue that you face at work? And talk about that for two or three minutes. Then separate film, film yourself responding to and talk about something that you love. And I do mean love. And it could be your children. It could be a hobby. It could be Liverpool FC. I don't mind. It doesn't matter. But film yourself. Then go back and watch the two videos. And I will bet you there will be a profound difference between the way that you look, the way that you talk and the way that you react with the camera and your perceived audiences. Which one of those is authentic? So identity is an authentic. It's a challenge for us in, in this respect. Let me just briefly move on. Identity is a, operates on a personal level. But what about when we look at the social level as well? In terms of the teams that we operate within, I identify myself as being part of a group. I think the Liverpool FC one is a really good one because we're identifying with a group. Yeah. Now, within our organisation, there's lots of groups that can be split by hierarchy, can be split by function, and all of them have got different identities. And we protect those identities against other groups because other groups compete against us. So and the groups only exist in relationships to other groups, because I can only say that I am an academic as distinct as an identity from people that work within the admin function, because there is a difference between the two. So the differences are important. Complicated, isn't it? When I introduce people to some work by a gentleman by the name of Irving Goffman. So this is the theory that comes into it. And we use the theory within our workplace, not to say that this is true, but to actually for you to critically reflect upon it and take from it whatever you want and bring it together in your own workings, your own practice. Because if you learn something, you might do something differently. If you don't learn anything, why would you do anything differently? So we are interested in promoting and facilitating your learning. How you apply that is really up to the individual learner. But Goffman suggests that when we meet people for the first time is it's based upon our own inferences. We infer, we seek information about people and we've disclosed information. Academic, what does that mean? Well, I'll tell you how people respond to academics is that I'm an academic. My wife is an accountant. I can tell you now we can clear a room at a party. Because if you say to them, so what, what do you do, Paul? I'm an academic. <laughs> what do you do, Barbara? I'm an accountant. <laughs> They're off. And we, we stood there. To, it's a good job we get on well together, me and my wife, because we spend a lot of time together, particularly at social gatherings. This is unusual. And the conclusions that we make about people is predicated on our prior experience. How many times do you actually speak to people and say, well, what's so-and-so like? I'm thinking about so-and-so for a group activity, for being in a team or for promotion. Oh, they're so-and-so and so-and-so. They're like this, they're like that. And we've made conclusions about them based upon prior experiences, but also about what they're supposed to be like. And we give off. We live by inference, therefore. 
and reciprocal influence of individuals upon one another's actions based upon immediate presence. In, in other words, this thing is dynamic and it's reciprocal. We change the relationship that exists between people. And as a consequence is that we change the notions about what those identities look like, which means we spend an awful lot of time at work on establishing our identities, being a manager, being a leader. How are they different? Being a follower. Now, I would guarantee that if I was to run a deep poll between all of you and say, um, who would like to do a leadership development programme? The majority of you would say yes. How many would want to do a management development programme? Probably less, maybe about 30 percent, I think, on sort of like a straw poll. But how many of you would like to do a follower development programme? I don't think that anybody would sign up to that. And why? Because they're the ones that do all the work. And actually, aren't you, in terms of your identities, leader, follower and manager? You do all of them all together in the same time, don't you? But you're sophisticated enough in order to know when you're supposed to be doing what. And that's you establishing your identities. Identity work is a big part of what we do is create identities. We present those identities, sustain it, form it, repair it, maintain it, strengthen it and we revise it. So the paradox, therefore, of leadership, uh, of authentic leadership is how authentic can you possibly be? And if you want to know the answer to that question, you have to sign up and do the programme. Here. Thank you, Paul. No, thank you. That was incredibly helpful. Um, I actually going to take your, your advice and do those two exercises. I can already imagine in my mind how different I'm going to look, which tells me something so, about the, the reason that the reason I know that is because of the fact I've done it um, uh, and I, I did that exercise and it was I, and I spoke about the biggest problems that I got at work um, and I was stilted. I was uncomfortable. I was overtly professional and very, very formal. And then I spoke about my son. Um, for two minutes and I softened and my voice changed, my pitch changed, my face softened out. Now, which one is authentic? Well, we would like to present the second one probably, but actually does that promote more vulnerabilities? Does Are there challenges within that? Because of the fact is that as a manager, and, and I was a chief executive at the time, and as a manager and as a leader, I was expected to do something which was different. And that is a challenge for us all. Uh, thank you, Paul. As, as, as always, um, but very thought provoking. Um, I'm going to invite the uh, audience who are here online to pop in a few questions you might have for Paul. OK, on the topic so of I've got one here from Hal. I can I can read them as they're coming through. So Hal said from experience, the right first follower can be a big kingmaker and big, can be a kingmaker in big organisations. And I'm going to ask Hal, is that is that based upon the YouTube video of being the first follower? where Santi Gold is playing music at a music festival and one guy's dancing in the middle of a field and then somebody else joins them. This is the first follower is the important one. Is that based upon or have you seen that within your own organisation? You can speak, Hal, if you want to. Just click your microphone and come on and talk. Hey, Paul. Um, Hi. Sorry, no, yeah, apologies. Like Santi Gold fan, noise. my friend. And I, there you go. And I'm being hugely <laughs> stereotypical in terms of identities. Uh, I. I must admit I've not heard any Santi Gold or uh, know oh, that, that but I have seen I have seen that video. Um, yeah, but the music uh, you've like dogged the memory there, there for yeah. um, uh, it, it wasn't in reference to that. I've just seen it uh, in the past. Uh, often somebody mentioned Dua as their uh, identity, right? And uh, I've often seen um, you know charismatic leaders not end up becoming doers, uh, but the the, the momentum Johnson. they build and the, the the empire they build within an organization is thanks to identifying doers and the right doers and bringing those doers in to uh, execute on their vision. Uh, and therefore, I think uh, when a specific type of leader gets that right team behind them and specifically that first person in their team to, to do on their behalf, they, that's where that comment comes from, that, that doer. That first follower could be the kingmaker there. 
Without, King Maker is King without, Maker is a bit of an archaic term, I guess. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You get the I idea. mean, the, 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 there's two things. One is that the the video about Santa Gold and the first follower that is is set up. It's actually a flash mob, and it was. Um, because it's been filmed from all different angles. I mean, as you see, it's not just one person that says, oh, look at this. However, the point that you made, because it's based upon your own experience, is much more valid than somebody's video on YouTube. And of course, followers are important, but they're very much underrated because people have to do stuff. Now, so the challenge, therefore, is that how do you influence and motivate Followers. Now, I, I'm of the view is that you can only influence and motivate people to the extent to which they want to be influenced and motivated. That's it. We've all been to the big influential presentations and your motivation and, and, and excitement for whatever the new initiative is will last until you open your inbox. And then you've got 40 emails and you're, and you're back down there again. And really, your influence is, is predicated upon three things is your ability to reason, your ability to charm, which is charisma. And charisma is individual, yeah, is that you can charm somebody. somebody. Somebody might have an appeal to you, but other people might not like you. And you have to accept the fact is that you won't be universally loved. I'm sorry, but that's a truism. So, you, the, the, so you've got, therefore, you've got reason, you've got charm, and the other one is coercion. Now, how you go about using all of those is an important thought in terms of your own practice but my guess is that you probably never really thought about oh i'm being coercive here i'm saying if you don't do x y and z or even if you say if you do this you'll get a pay rise or you'll get a new promotion that's coercion is that how often do we think about the way that we influence people it's sort of like it's almost it's it's, it's mostly it's thought of as being magic isn't it but you know hal's point is uh, i think you know as followers do the work is really is really an important one how you react with your followers is in essence the definition of leadership leaders have followers people okay. in work people in work don't need to follow you either they can follow who they want they don't need to follow you it's, it's, they've got their own agency nice point anyway Hal thank you very much Thank you for the question, Hal. Anybody else out there got any comments that they'd like to make just to add to the conversation? That's what this is. We're having a conversation. So please feel free to, to add your thoughts. Uh, there's no right and wrongs here. It's it's all a, an opportunity to share what your thoughts are on authentic leadership and the challenges <coughs> that might present. So Bradley, I mean, you, you said, well, what's the difference between being a leader and a manager? Uh, has anything that we've said so far either confused the issue or has made it more clear to you? You could talk to just come on and speak. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily say um, either, to be honest. Um, it's something that is always as kind of transitioning through career, personally and professionally. It's always something I found interesting that you start off before most people start off um, as non-managers and then they transition into a people manager and then into a department manager and so on that's normally the, the into a what a power manager no it's a department departmental oh, department. manager so oh, people that, and then i quite like the notion of a power manager i was going to ask you to talk about like, that you might find that one's in my teaching work from now on that's, yeah, no. one, so that's a good one that and you start off as kind of i don't know if the right phrase is is managing without authority and leadership within managing without authority and how that transitions almost accidentally into being a strong people leader and a strong departmental manager so that's what i meant by being a leader rather than a manager because yeah. one doesn't necessarily follow the other yeah uh, there are, there's lots of work that's been done on differentiating the two and it's very difficult to be able to define exactly what leadership is we kind of like know it when we see it which is mm. interesting but then it's also equally as difficult to be able to define exactly what management is as well. And, and so I get around this by saying, why does it matter? Because it's the same person that's doing the same job. You are both leader and manager and you have a set of skills that's within you. You don't take this head off, put another one and go, I'm leading now. Where's my leading skills? You just carry on and you do the same sort of thing. So on that basis, therefore, I think that leadership itself has been over exaggerated. And management has been under exaggerated or has been under emphasized because they're both important things.
Now, you're right, your position changes as you go through your career life, which means that you get more emphasis. Now, as I said, I was a chief executive. And when I was a chief executive, all I did was I talked to people. That was it. I, and when, when I was and I was much happier being a general manager when I was talking to people, but I still did some stuff as well. And th there's a change as you go through um, your, your career. And I think you make a really interesting point there. There's some. Thank you very much, Bradley. That's really good. Um, can, there's some more points, Kieran, that's been brought up by Hal. Yeah. Yeah, I think Hal, Hal um, is, it was chiming in with that idea of different types of authority or credibility and mentioned that whole area of, you know, it's a business school and we, we yeah. mentioned that you've got a doctorate. Um, I, yeah. know I, I put it on the title slide because that's, yeah, that's yeah. your title. Yeah. I'm not sure but it's something that you I would, wouldn't. There you go. I think that's that's the explanation for it, Hal, to be honest with you. Paul called it out because I think your your, your preference is, is to just be Paul. Rather yeah, than my, that absolutely. Term. That's that, that's my name. So um, that's what I, I, I kind of like respond to. Dr. Evans, I don't, I don't, it doesn't register with me at all. Paul, that's fine. Mr. Evans, that's my dad. So I don't really register with that either. Um, and in when I teach in China, they call me professor and I just look around and say, well, somebody walked in. It's, a, a, it's, a, it's interesting. And there's the point that Hal's made in terms of um, the, in the, he came, up, came hot with a doctorate, um, a slide highlighted it. Yeah, establishing myself as knowledgeable in this area. And so, but I mean, I wanted to draw attention to the identity construction that goes on because of the fact that you've just got DR before your name. Yeah. Does an organisation need the right colour or culture to allow authentic leadership to be effective? Oh, blimey, that's a chicken and egg type thing. The, 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 the theory suggests that leaders create cultures. Well, I'll leave you with this one, Matthew. The cultures create leaders. Yeah. So in other words, what's the what's the causal relationship or is it reciprocal? Yeah. So, and the answer to we, we don't know really. the answer to that is, is kind of like unknown, really. And, uh, back to how is it wasn't taken as a criticism at all, my friend, at all. It was a point that was very, very well made. And that's the important thing is I think that when in the teaching room with us is that you can it, it, nobody has a monopoly on truth. Nobody. So you can critique anybody's perspectives, including mine and especially mine. Right? So don't apologise for having the gumption to actually. Now, I can argue my case and I will argue my case. But on occasions, I realise that I'm wrong and I have to take the and I have to say and I'll give you I'll give you an example of this is it. it it's a while back now, but it was an undergraduate student that wrote an essay for me. She came to see me before she wrote it because she'd done particularly poorly in her first essay. Now, when I marked it is that uh, you don't know who the person is because it's all marked anonymously. Otherwise, you have preconceived notions about so and so and so and so. So anyway, so I marked the paper and it, it was outstanding. And then there was this particular and the only feedback that I could give her is that this paper is outstanding. I don't agree with a word of it. But nevertheless, it's outstanding. And she'd made her point perfectly, perfectly well. And that is the point of academic progress or theoretical progress. And then that's for you to take that theory, to think about how you might apply it, practice it, test it and embed it in your routines of behaviours in order to be able to become a better leader, manager, follower than you are now. That's the point of it is to learn new stuff and use it, not to accept the word of somebody like me as being true. And I have to do X, Y and Z. That's not the point in case. So we can only direct you. But it's hard work on your part. And I will I will say this now is that studying at postgraduate level is tough, not necessarily intellectually or academically tough. I think that's hard work, but you can all do it. Definitely. But it's tough in terms of managing time and managing careers and managing families and so on and so forth. I, I found that when I've done higher studies, there's three identities, student, manager or professional, family man. And there was a conflict between the three all the time. And I felt like I was I was failing at one of them at any particular point in my my studies. But the point is you get beyond it. And you will too. Well, how do I know that? Well, because I see thousands of students every year that all do the same thing to get through it. And sometimes it's just 
a bit of hard work and a bit of application that's required. Uh, thank you, Paul, and thank you to the audience for the questions coming in. That's probably t talking of time and 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 framing um, the the sort of the difficulty or the opportunity uh, for studying and and the tension between those sort of different identities. Paul, I'd like to thank you for your your your, your session there. We're going to move back and sort of situate that con that content back in the contents of the apprenticeship. Now, Paul started to to talk about it there. He talked about this sort of um, uh, postgraduate journey. It, it is challenging, and hopefully, what you've seen from our session this morning so far is that you know there's a there's a candor there in our approach there's a, a challenge there in our approach so we want to see how does this fit within an actual program a program that you might come and study so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to sharing my screen and I can see my colleague there Avila is going to take over and talk a little bit more about where this content comes from this apprenticeship this authentic leadership module is one of the modules that sits inside our senior leader apprenticeship Avila over to you Thank you, Kieran. Yeah, so we'll just start by looking at who is the program for basically. Um, so it is aimed at middle level managers aspiring to senior leadership roles. So if you are already in a senior leadership role, this may not be the course for you. In terms of what we would want those on the program to get from it, well, we will look at developing the knowledge, skills and behaviours of current and future leaders. Those KSBs are what a lot of our teaching is based around um, and we do follow a, a framework of excellence that is nationally recognised as well. Thank you. Um, so what what do we look at in the course? So as Kieran um, and Paul have already touched on, we have the following themes that we will look into. Today we tapped into a snippet of authentic leadership and culture. But you can cast your eye again on the rest of the kind of themes that we will look at. The programme is levy funded um, and what that means is the levy is a pot that organisations with a payroll of over three million a year pay into. Organisations can then use this fund purely for apprenticeships um, and that's what would cover the £14,000 for this course. It's blended, so we will have face-to-face uh, -face teaching. So this is usually in the form of workshops um, as part of each 10 week block. Um, but we also have the online element um, giving us that blended approach to delivery. 18 months in duration, so around 15 months of teaching followed by three months kind of looking at your endpoint assessment, etc. And upon completion, you will gain a postgraduate diploma in senior leadership from the University of Manchester. There is a route to master's which involves handed over the diploma, ex exchange it for the master's element, which involves six months extra study and 4,000 extra um, in terms of cost, which is not covered by the apprenticeship levy. So that would be up to yourself or your organisation. Um, as with all apprenticeships, you are studying as you work. So there is that opportunity to apply what you're learning immediately and seeing those tangible um, impact at your organisation. So why us? Why this programme? Um, in terms of the University of Manchester itself, so we are globally renowned for our, our teaching. Um, you've seen a snippet from Paul today in terms of what that looks like. Um, and Paul sits within a team of, of excellent academics. Um, we award winning academics and we score very highly on our, on our teaching. We're recognised, so University of Manchester is recognised globally um, and you will finish with the postgraduate diploma from the University of Manchester um, and the impact of that. As Paul touched on, the course is challenging. Uh, there's there's no way of, of hiding from that. We are trying to transform you so it's very much transformational not transactional we'll want you to become a more reflective um, and self-aware leader so there definitely will be challenges and it will push you out of your comfort zone throughout the program when we move on to the strategic part so what we want to do is move beyond operational excellence we want you to be a leader when you finish this course that is comfortable sitting and making strategic decisions the endpoint assessment involves the strategic business proposal, but we also have the strategic management unit as well, which is one of those ones that we touched on on an earlier slide. A big part of the University of Manchester is being able to apply what we learn um, 
we want to be able to see impacts in your workplace. It's not just theory. We will ask for evidence of how what you're learning is having an impact and that will be in your portfolio. Obviously, the benefits of this stretch to you, your organisation, and we do focus on being able to apply what we teach you in the course. And finally, original. So we have recently redesigned the course um, from the ground upwards. The themes that you will have noticed on the previous slides are all very topical, all very current themes. Um, and there is a variety of those in terms of the themes, but also the practice, how we challenge you, how we teach you. There is variety in terms of delivery as well. So in terms of getting onto the programme, so we break it down in terms of a degree and three, basically. So if you've got that first degree, which is a two one or higher, then we're looking for that along with three years management experience. If you find yourself that you have no degree or a degree that's below two two, then we ask for five years managerial experience. The reason we focus on this managerial experience is because of the kind of peer review and the peer discussion element of the course. We want you to start this course at a time where you have sufficient experience to draw upon, get the most from the course. And that's one of the big reasons why we do look into your managerial experience. It's worth noting um, that due to apprenticeship rules, upon completion, you are required to have your maths and English GCSE or level two functional skills. But please don't be put off if you're not if you don't have these um, when you're starting the course, because it is just upon completion and we can assist with setting you up in order to to get that box ticked. And finally, so in terms of eligibility, um, so a big part of my role is having those initial discussions to make sure that we invite the right candidates to apply for the programme. Because it is funded by the apprenticeship levy, we do have strict rules. Some of these cover things like working 30 hours minimum a week, being based in England, etc. And it's why we do encourage and we will ask you to complete the online eligibility checker as a first step, just to make sure we're not inviting someone and wasting their time further down the line in terms of them not being eligible for the funding. Um, the link I believe Kieran will be putting in the chat, but of course after you can reach out and you can find that on our website as well. Thank you, Kieran. And in terms of contact us, please don't hesitate to reach out um, to either myself or Kieran. More than happy to take any questions related to anything from the application process to the content of the course. Um, you have our emails here as well as our numbers. And I think I'll hand over to Kieran for any concluding comments, Kieran. Thanks, Avila. So, um, yeah, we've got one question that I'd like to pick up there from Matthew, who's currently studying a CMI Level 5 diploma. Uh, great stuff. Um, in terms of entry requirements, I'm going to give you a, an answer that, that is, is probably more accurate. So you're asking, does this does this sort of qualify for entry? What we tend to do, Matthew, is we look at the whole person. We look at all of your learning and look at that and assess that. It's called recognition of prior learning. So any studying you've done before of any kind, we will look at that, take it into account. So so if you've got a degree, that will form part of it. If you don't have a degree, about a third of the people that come on our programmes don't have, uh, haven't got an undergraduate degree, and that's absolutely fine. So I can't give you a, a concrete answer, yes or no, here without looking a bit more closely at your uh, individual situation, Matthew, and your experience, what training courses you've done. Um, so apologies, I can't give you a, a straight answer on that one. Unfortunately, it is a bit of a, it depends. So, but if you want to get in touch with myself or Avila, very happy to set up that chat with you. Have a look at what you've studied previously and we can kind of give you a much clearer picture of whether or not you would be eligible. Um, and, and going online and, and can trying to complete that eligibility checker is probably quite a good idea. Um, can the PG DIP be converted into an MSc at any point in the future? Yes, I, I've forgotten the um, specific timeline. There is a sort of a, a limitation on it. Uh, if you complete the PG DIP, you can come back within, I think it's a couple of years. It may be as long as four. I'd have to check on that. Um, 
you don't have to complete it straight away. So anybody who wants to undertake the programme will complete it. You get your apprenticeship, you get your postgraduate diploma from the University of Manchester, and then you can decide, you know, do I want to continue with my studies? And if you don't, yes, you could come back and complete a, a unit at a, at a later date and top it up to a master's. Basically, the postgraduate diploma is a level seven qualification. So you're studying at master's level. The difference between the postgraduate diploma and the master's are the number of credits that you amass. You basically, you'll get to so many credits with your postgraduate diploma and you just need to to do a bit more studying at the same level to top it up to a master's or an MSc. So I hope that explains that, Matthew. Do get in touch with us if you want a further chat. Uh, great question from Laura. How many hours of work would you say the course commands per week, please? Great question. Um, Avila, do you want to chime in on that in terms of what the, uh, the, the, the minimum sort of statutory requirement is and then kind of what we expect people as well? Yeah, so we would say that there's a minimum of six hours per week in terms of what we call off the job training. Um, this is work that is undertaken during your normal working hours, but falls outside of your normal tasks. So essentially wouldn't really be in your current job description and are in line with those KSBs that we discussed. Um, we ask you to evidence that as well throughout. I would stress that, and Kieran could probably chip in again, but the six hours is a minimum per week. Um, and then on top of that, you will have some of your assessments. And if you did have, for example, a workshop that you're required to be in for that week as well. So, yeah, uh, absolutely. The six hours is what's required for the funding. So uh, I guess the critical thing that Laura is get, get have a conversation with your employer. They're going to have to, it sounds like, release you for a minimum of six hours a week doesn't quite work like that. But yes, they'll have to release you to come to workshops here at Manchester, but there may be tasks that they can give you that fall outside your day job that actually would count as getting you closer towards this senior leader goal. It's called evidence gathering. So let's say you work in a certain department and you might be required to go and work in a different department, sit in a meeting, be part of a project team for a different project. That counts as this off the job. It's not in your normal day job, but it could count towards the hours you need to amass to evidence that you are now a fully capable senior leader. So the advice there was, if you're thinking about hours, you're thinking on the right lines, have a conversation with your line manager. Um, is there capacity to free you up to go and work on these different projects outside of your day job? Does that give somebody uh, alongside you or below you an opportunity to act up and pick up some of the work that you would have otherwise been doing? But it's really important to get your employer support for that. It's a it's an 18 month program. So it's a sort of thing. It's not just every couple of weeks. You, you need to be thinking about six hours a week minimum or, or equivalent. You know, if you do only do four hours one week, you can make it up the following week or the week after. Um, but it's also worth getting that employer on board so that they understand, OK, this isn't about me going and sitting in a room one day a week and studying. This is about me using what I'm learning on the course and applying it in different ways in the organisation I work in. I hope that makes sense. OK, um, how about extracurricular work towards your assignments? Just to be OK, OK, so you probably want if, if six hours in the minimum, minimum work on maybe like another three or four hours a week on top of that. But I would stress, you know, um, most of that needs to be within your working within your working day. This is an apprenticeship. It's about studying whilst you work. Um, so, yeah, I guess a hot tip would be plan your time um, ahead of ahead of a program. Uh, you know, have the conversations with your nearest and dearest, have the conversations with people at work. Is this the right time for me? Paul, do you want to chime in on that? Yeah, if you don't mind, it's to, in terms of face to face time, um, Laura, uh, each unit that you take, there's 25 hours that are allocated over a 10 week period for face to face time. But that is everything so that would be tutorials which are online so that would be an hour hour and a half the bulk of it is is a workshop which is a two-day workshop which would be 14 hours so the majority of your face-to-face -face time is done in the workshop then there are online tutorials that are throughout the throughout the 10-week program that you do replicated then over the course of the um uh, over the course of your degree um but I would also want to stress, and this is kind of like my experience, I don't know any academic in this place that doesn't like talking about the stuff they teach. So if any of you are ever saying, well, I'm struggling a bit with this, I could do with a bit more face to face time, get in contact and we'll see if we can help you out. Yeah. Um, but it's 25 hours as a minimum on each particular unit. 
and there's uh, six core units and then there's another two units towards the end of the program or, uh, included in the program they're included well. in the program Which, yeah but there is, there's less contact time in those um in those those two additional units okay Thank you, Paul. Um, we are pretty much at time, um, and I know a couple of you are having to drop off for time, so all that remains is for me to thank um, Paul. Do, um, there's just sorry. one point, is that somebody asked a question about the difference between the MSC and the MBA, and I want to address that before you sign okay. us off. Okay, so the, the MBA is a well-known degree. You pay for it yourself. It's very expensive, so there's a difference there for one thing. It results in the same qualification, which is a master's degree. The 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 thing that I would and I teach on both right so I'm an advocate of both programs and it depends what you're doing your degree for if you want to be better at your job then I think that the MSC uh, sorry the, the PG dip into the MSC is the best route for it why because it's integrated into what you do at work whereas the MBA is abstracted away from what you do at work yeah you're MS, your PG dip is always asking you to reflect upon things that are occurring at work and how you might respond for them and how you can address your own learning in terms of your practice. The other thing that I can say definitively about the PG dip is it works. Now, how do we know it works? Well, because of the anecdotal stories that we get from people that have moved on in their careers or have transitioned in their careers or are doing different things within their organisations. But also we see it in the things that you write for us, where you are demonstrating a different skill set at the end of the programme than you are at the beginning of the programme. And for somebody like me, who is an academic and a teacher, I have to tell you, not only is this very humbling to be involved in your development, but it is incredibly incredibly worthwhile and it's something that we all very much believe in because of the fact that we've seen the fact that it works okay thank you paul and yeah great reminder of the difference between the two programs um i'd like to say thank you to paul and thank you to avila and thank you to all of you for joining us today um, the recording will be sent out along with a couple of slides not the full deck uh, from today but please do get in touch with us if you've got questions about the program or we'd like to talk to one of the team we're here we're listening so give us a call OK, have everybody, everybody have a, a very good rest of your day uh, and um, thank you once again. Bye for now. Cheers all. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.